He is a professor at the University of California in Santa Cruz, he's our neighbor. The original plan for this talk was to have Chris as the preserve, hike some of our trails, discuss, you know, just wildlife and nature and have time to just okay. show him around. But I first, I first met him at a, at a talk that he gave for mountain bikers of Santa Cruz. And it was very nice. I was kind of like, this talk is answering most of my mountain lion questions. And obviously it makes you make more questions about animals that are all around us. And understanding that and his collaborators had about these big cats is just amazing. And over the last- um, You've got to help me here, man. Over, over the last months, mountain lions have turned into a main conversation topic at the preserve. And I think this will will give you a better a better information on, on what's what's mountain lion life, how they interact with us. And and yeah, I, th I think you will really enjoy it. And please think on think on, on, on questions for for, for a presenter. I mean, he's, he's really good. And I think without further, uh, let's, let's just have his, his talk. Welcome, Chris. Great, thank you, Rodrigo. And um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, instead, I get to speak to you from my lovely garage. Um, but maybe just uh, really quick, if everybody could just check their microphones and uh, make sure that they're muted. And then um, uh, I think I'll just, I'll talk for a little while and then open it up to questions from everybody. Three people on here. Um, great, so, so today I'm gonna talk to you about um, research we've been doing in the Santa Cruz mountains on mountain lions. Uh, it's been ongoing for about, uh, 13 years now. And um, before I get before I get too far into it, I just want to um, point out that this is really uh, a large collaborative effort with, you know, graduate students and various other um, professors and PIs and and a number of field biologists who've worked for me over the year, a uh, number of houndsmen who helped us catch the animals to mark them a pilot, an illustrator, and really dozens, if not actually hundreds at this point of undergraduate volunteers uh, with lots of different funding sources and some um, great photographers who have helped us capture some wonderful images over the years. So, you know, when we think of large predators, um, and, you know, that's, that's really mostly what I study is large carnivores and how human land use change and climate change is, is impacting their populations and their ecology. And so when we think of these large carnivores like leopards and lions and pumas, you know, this is how we kind of imagine them as, you know, in these incredibly beautiful habitats, uh, roaming free. Um, unfortunately, you know, increasingly uh, humanity is, is, is infringing on their habitats. And so this is leading their habitats to become, you know, fragmented um, uh, instead of being, you know, large contiguous open spaces, it's now sort of more of these sort of patches of habitat uh, mixed within a matrix of, you know, uninhabitable, you know, cities or farmlands or what have you. And so um, on the one hand, that's causing their populations to decline on the other hand, it's causing, you know, ecological relationships within these habitats to change quite markedly. So some of my work and the work of others has looked at how, um, you know, large predators can affect um, ecosystems. So uh, in this sort of famous study now, in the, uh, the 1990s, uh, a fellow named John Turborg and colleagues looked at what happens to some tropical islands or tropical rainforest in, um, in South America when you remove um, pumas and jaguars from the landscape. And what they found was that when you remove these guys, uh, the numbers of monkeys and um, 
ants and iguanas and other herbivores increases like 10 to 100 fold. And that has uh, fairly dramatic impacts on the ecosystem, changing it from the sort of lush verdant forest to this, you know, uh, much browner um, forest, largely denuded of vegetation. Um, another, another sort of uh, avenue of research we've looked into is how predators, uh, through the same impact through herbivores on plants, might affect carbon cycling. So in some work here, um, you know, off the Pacific coast, we've looked at um, sea otters and how they impact uh, kelp ecosystems. And um, one of my colleagues here at UCSC, Jim Estes, has spent a career sort of documenting the impacts of, of sea otters on kelp ecosystems. And sea otters basically eat sea urchins who eat kelp. And so when you remove the sea otters, what you find is that the um, the sea urchins increase in number and they graze down all the kelp. And so that has a really dramatic impact on ecosystem carbon, um, uh, you know, about a tenfold impact. And if you um, look at the whole range of sea otters uh, across the Pacific Ocean and you were to value the amount of carbon they help sequester in uh, in the ecosystem, uh, when we did this study, there was a uh, there was a market for carbon. You could actually value that now. I don't think it exists anymore. But when we did, we valued that carbon at between two hundred and four hundred million dollars. Um, and then the last uh, sort of mention I'll give to predators and some of our research on how they impact ecosystems is looking at predators and disease. And so. Here we've got a wolf chasing a coyote in Yellowstone. And um, that's kind of, you know, the, the way things should be. Um, but when humans came to North America, we, we wiped out most of the wolf populations. And so as a result, uh, coyotes greatly expanded their range. They used to be a species that were mostly constrained to Western grasslands. But then with the removal of wolves from the landscape, and uh, you know the sort of opening up of habitat, um, coyotes moved eastward and uh, colonized you know all the the eastern states of the U.S. And what we found was that when you look in those states, um, and when you remove wolves, you get an increase in coyotes and deer. That causes a decrease in uh, in foxes and an increase in mice. And it turns out that uh, Lyme disease, uh, which requires deer ticks, um, uh, Lyme disease is highly dependent on these mice and these deer. The deer basically help you have more ticks and the mice contribute to the spreading of the disease. And so uh, uh, removing wolves and having more coyotes sort of created this perfect storm for Lyme disease to emerge as a real threat throughout the East Coast. Okay, so uh, moving on to mountain lions and the Santa Cruz Mountains. You know, we were really interested in how humans influence everything from the behavior and physiology of these animals up to their populations and impacts on ecosystems. And we tend to think of the impacts of people is primarily occurring through landscape changes associated with development, development of roads, development of houses. Um, and so you can think of that development as fragmenting the landscape. And I like to think of this occurring at a couple scales. The first is at this sort of large landscape scale where you have, you know, big landscape blocks of habitat like the Santa Cruz Mountains you see here, which is separated by all that you know, by Silicon Valley and 101, all that concrete and roads. And then you have the Hamilton Range adjacent. And so at this large landscape scale, you've got these different habitat blocks that are separated from each other to a certain extent. And then within the home range of an individual mountain lion, you might also have habitat fragmentation. So here we are looking down at the UCSC campus and 
you know, everywhere where there's trees in this picture, um, you know, you're going to have mountain lions coming through here. Um, but you can see those trees and natural habitat are broken up in places by buildings and roads. And so that's creating another kind of fragmentation at a smaller scale. And then, uh, and then of course, you have these highways. This is Highway 17. Highway 101 is another major one in our area um, that cause, create these substantial barriers to movement and also a, a source for mortality um, for mountain lions. So um, fragmentation can have all kinds of impacts. You know, at, a, at the sort of lighter level, it can cause injuries. This is a mountain lion that was um, hit on Highway 17. It, uh, it removed about a square foot of skin from his rump, but he later recovered. Um, here's uh, a deer where the same thing has happened to her, we think. Um, you know, basically a really bad case of road rash. But you know, not all animals are so lucky. Um, a number of mountain lions have died on uh, Highway 17 and other roadways. Um, and then you have some of the more nefarious effects of fragmentation. Um, rodenticides or rat poisons are a really important source of disease and mortality in, in large carnivores. This is a coyote about 20 feet from my house here in Santa Cruz and a bobcat about uh, maybe 500 feet from my house in Santa Cruz, um, both of which are suffering from mange. And uh, these animals have been shown to uh, be much more susceptible to mange as a result of um, eating rodents who have been, uh, um, who have, you know, um, been dosed with rodenticides. And so the, the rodenticide doesn't always immediately kill or doesn't necessarily kill the carnivores, but it weakens their immune systems and makes them much more vulnerable to diseases like mange. And then finally, uh, fragmentation at this sort of landscape scale can, um, can create uh, 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 the deterioration of genetics in these populations where animals are no longer able to interbreed with animals from other mountain ranges. And so you get more and more inbreeding and that leads to deleterious genetic effects. Um, for instance, this picture is a, a kinked mountain lion tail in Florida on the upper panel there. And then, um, and then you, we also find low sperm counts, malformed sperm and cryptocortism. Cryptocortism is where the testicles fail to descend. And these have all been well documented in uh, the Florida panther, um, but we're now starting to see the, these negative genetic effects occurring in animals in California as well especially along the coast um, south of the bay. So um, uh, these, these uh, genetic effects, um, I'm not gonna speak about too much more today, but uh, we did some work. Uh, we had a large statewide analysis come out in 2018 showing that populations of mountain lions, particularly from the Bay Area south to the Mexican border along the coast, are highly fragmented from each other. So, you know, animals in the Santa Cruz Mountains, for instance, are not uh, exchanging genes um, with animals in the Santa Lucia range. Um, normally, we would surely expect them to, but because of the roads and development in between us, mountain lions are no longer able to get back and forth and share genetics. And so that's um, leading to very low levels of uh, genetic variability. And based on that paper, um, the state has just, um, uh, the, the state was petitioned to list mountain lions south of the bay as a state threatened endangered species and, uh, or as state threatened species. And, um, the California Game Commission just accepted that um, uh, petition and is now reviewing it for a year and a final determination will happen in a year. Okay, so to, to do work on these guys, um, we need to find them first of all. And so we do a lot of reconnaissance with, um, with game cameras. 
And, um, and then to capture them, um, we, use one, we use two different techniques. The first is that we, uh, we, we use hound dogs. So the way hound dogs works is you're sort of taking advantage of the natural evolutionary relationship that's um, evolved between dogs and cats. And so uh, we use the dogs to put them on what we hope is a fresh mountain lion trail. And then if all goes right, the dogs will um, chase that animal up into a tree. And then we come along and, uh, you know, the animal is, is uh, hanging out in the tree. And then we, um, we shoot it with a tranquilizer dart. There's a few people maybe that have their um, microphones turned on. So just be aware of that folks. If you can turn off your microphone and put it on mute, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so we, we, uh, we tranquilize the animal. The animal usually comes down on its own. Uh, occasionally we have to uh, climb up there and lower it down ourselves. And then uh, once the animal's on the ground, um, we give it a tracking collar, which has a GPS and uh, to, to understand where the animal is moving. And then a um, accelerometer, which allows us to to say how many calories the animal's burning and what is its behavior as it moves around the landscape. You know, where is it feeding? Where is it running? Where is it walking? You know, that kind of thing. And then we take a bunch of measurements, weight, uh, length, height. Um, we draw blood so that we can look at genetics, um, all sorts of things like that. So, um, so I get a number of questions from uh, from other scientists and from the public. Um, you know, the first is, well, what do pumas eat? And the easy answer to that is deer. Um, mountain lions are an ambush predator. And so they sneak up on their uh, prey uh, and, you know, ambush it and, and, and kill them that way. Um, mostly they eat deer. Um, they do uh, uh, eat some smaller predators like coyotes. Um, here's a little video from someone's home security system of a mountain lion chasing a coyote. And then here's a uh, interaction with an opossum. Um, that's one tough opossum, I gotta say. And then, um, <laughs> and then here's a, uh, so apologize for the bad language there. Can you guys all hear that? Just maybe nod your head that you didn't hear any sound. Um, So I just want to check my video settings to, it would be good if you guys could hear sound. Um, I think somewhere on the top in the view options, there's a way to share your sound if you're the one sharing your screen. Okay, so there's... Or somewhere maybe like down near your video settings or somewhere. I was having trouble with this the other day when I was Zooming with a family member. Um, I see like a video settings, but it doesn't seem to have a, um, oh, well, um, if, if you think of, uh, 
if you think of it, let me know. Um, that last, uh, I, I'll, I'll try to narrate the sound in, in the videos. <laughs> um, that last uh, video you saw was a mountain lion um, pulling, a, catching a raccoon off of um, someone's porch. Um, so this is a breakdown of, of what mountain lions actually eat. So this is from, uh, from the GPS uh, collars that we have on these animals. Um, we can uh, uh, find the kills that they make by going to where they've been um, after they leave and finding the remains of prey. And so we see that, you know, they eat about 76% deer, 7% raccoons, 5% house cats, and then a smattering of other stuff. Um, goats are here at 2%, and the, they, they, uh, they can't really resist goats. The problem with goats is that um, when they kill someone's goat, the landowner will often retaliate and, um, and depredate the animal. Um, and uh, that's actually the leading source of mortality for mountain lions in our, our region is, is depredation. This is, uh, this is another way to look at the same data. This is, instead of how many of each animal they're, they're killing, this is uh, um, how much food they're getting from each species. So um, deer uh, amount, account for 95% of their calories roughly. Um, and then, you know, just this smidgen of other stuff. So they're really, you can really think of them primarily as, um, as deer predators. So sorry, I just got a message about the sharing computer sound. Where would I find the sharing computer sound? Uh -oh. um, sorry, I'm just trying to get the sound to work here. One second here. All right, sorry, I can't find it. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, the next question people often ask me is, do people fear humans? So, you know, if I were to show you this, you might say, well, maybe not. Um, if you look at that yellow circle there, that's my building on the UCSC campus. And then if you look at this yellow arrow, it's pointing to the GPS location of this mountain lion 36M. And uh, he, killed this deer right here. Um, and that's my office building right behind me. And then he came back and fed on it again that night. So, um, you know, it sort of looks like maybe he was stalking me. Um, but we decided to actually test this scientifically um, by setting up an experiment where we would, um, we can tell, since we can tell where the mountain lions are, are making their kills, uh, we can go in there and what we did is we would set up a video camera on the kill, um, which would get triggered when the mountain lion came back to feed. And when it got triggered, we had it attached to an MP3 player and a speaker. And um, the speaker would play the sounds of either 
people talking, which was our treatment, and or frogs croaking, which was like our control. And then we would see what the mountain lion did. And so, um, so okay, so here's the video. Uh, if you could hear it, you would hear rain falling right now. Um, and now if you would, you would hear frogs croaking and the lion not caring at all about it. And so now coming up is the human treatment. Okay, so now you'll hear starting right now, you would hear Rush Limbaugh uh, talking on one of his radio shows. And so you can see what the line does. Um, and so if you look at the results, what we found was that um, uh, if we look at this first panel A, um, mountain lions almost always flee, flee uh, when they hear people. And they almost never flee when they hear frogs. Um, and just in case you were wondering whether we only used Rush Limbaugh's voice, we actually used partisans on both the left and the right ends of the political spectrum. And we also used nonpartisans. We used women, we used men. And mountain lions were totally nonpartisan in their fear of people. Um, and then if you look at, you know, the mountain lions will sometimes come back. And if they heard frogs, they would come back, if they left at all, they would come back much more quickly than if they had heard people. And then this translates into having an ecological effect. And that is that if they've heard people talking at their kill, they're gonna spend about half as long actually feeding on that kill than if they heard frogs. And so, you know, you have this behavioral result that mountain lions fear people having this ecological impact that they feed less. And so what happens as a result of that? Well, to look at that, we, um, we looked at uh, hundreds of kill sites that our collared mountain lions had made over the years. And we looked at the context in which those kills were made, you know, were they made close to homes or far from homes? Um, and what we found is that when mountain lions, you know, kill close to people's homes, um, they tend to uh, um, you know, feed in the wee hours of the night. And then during the day, they kind of go a few hundred meters away and, and sort of hide out. And then they come back the next evening, sort of you know, in the wee hours of the evening again. On the other hand, if they kill far away from people's home in the middle of open space, they don't really care whether it's night or day, they just stay there the whole time. And so, as a result, they end up feeding a lot more or a lot longer on kills that they make far from people's homes, about twice as long. And the consequence of that is that mountain lions that have a lot of houses in their home ranges um, have to kill about 50% more deer a year than mountain lions that live in wide open places. So if we look at this graph, we have housing density on the bottom and kill rate deer per year and it goes from you know just over 50 to over 75 deer a year depending on um, depending on housing density. So um, here we see that that behavioral effect of mountain lions fearing people has this sort of strong ecological effect of resulting in them killing more deer. Okay so then we wanted to know okay well what happens if there's just people in the forest in general, you know, not necessarily uh, close to a kill, but just forest in general? Um, how would that affect mountain lion behavior? And how would it affect, you know, really the whole food chain, not just mountain lions, but other predators and their prey? And so we did an experiment where in two parts of the Santa Cruz Mountains, um, sort of on the ocean facing side and on the bay facing side, uh, we took two, we found two places where we set up a one square kilometer grid of speakers every 200 meters. 
um, playing the sounds of either people talking for a month and then frogs for a month. We did that in one place. And then the other place we did uh, frogs first for a month, people talking for a month. And uh, we collared every mountain lion that overlapped those grids. And we had their collars sampling a location every five minutes so we could see, you know, with fairly high accuracy how they would move in relationship to the grid. And then we also had uh, cameras spread throughout the grid to look at how uh, other predators, namely bobcats, skunks, possums, um, would respond to the human treatment. And then finally, um, we trapped for small mammals to see if they would, if they responded as well. So, um, you know, we had sort of two predictions. The first was that, you know, maybe mountain lions, we were, we we're pretty confident mountain lions would avoid or, or somehow change their behavior in relationship to the treatment. Um, and then we weren't sure how the smaller predators would respond. You know, maybe these smaller predators that also get killed by mountain lions would, uh, would um, be very happy that mountain lions weren't there and sort of be out in, in force. And then that would uh, cause rodents to, you know, potentially decline. Um, or we thought that we alternatively, we hypothesized that, well, you know, humans actually, um, other research has shown that humans are the predominant or the largest cause of mortality for, for most predators. So maybe all the predators avoid humans and then the rodents have a heyday. And so, what we found was that um, uh, mountain lions indeed kind of uh, avoided the grid. So uh, here, what you see is this blue track is the track of a mountain lion when frogs were playing. And you can see they just sort of amble through the grid and don't really seem to care. Um, the red is a typical mountain lion track when the humans are playing. And so you can see they get close to it, they hear the speaker and they sort of walk around it and circumnavigate the grid. And so what we found is that mountain lions are way more likely to avoid the grid um, when people are in there. Um, if they do go in, they move much more cautiously. They basically, they slow down and um, they split the distance between speakers and they just sort of creep through there. Um, and then it turns out that all the other predators were afraid of humans too. Um, they had slightly different mechanisms for being afraid. Bobcats became more nocturnal. Skunks just stopped going there. Um, possums uh, stopped taking risks when they were feeding. And so all these sort of smaller carnivores also had a similar response of fear to human. And then what do you see with the rodents? We see that the, the mice um, doubled their home range sizes and the mites, mice and wood rats um, uh, started foraging much more intensely. So um, if we think about what's happening in the forest, this is kind of an illustration of what's going on when there's no people in the forest. You got your predators out and then you got your prey kind of hunkering down um, not moving very much and um, being quite shy. Um, when you have people in the forest, even if they're just talking, um, all of a sudden, ah, shoot. All of a sudden, the, uh, the carnivores make themselves scarce and the rodents um, have a field day. Okay, so how does this fear of people influence where mountain lions go? Um, this is a illustration of just some of our data um, plotted over a satellite image of the Santa Cruz mountains. And uh, what I'm showing you here is each color represents a different animal and each sort of dot or square in that color is like, you know, one day in the life of. So it sort of gives you a sense for home range size and that kind of thing. It also kind of looks like mountain lions go everywhere. Um, but if you zoom in to where they're going and how they're moving, you see that they're actually quite cautious. So 
this is a mountain lion exploring the west side of Santa Cruz, uh, where I live. And what you can see is that um, you never see the mountain lion out in the middle of the meadow, right? They're always in the cover of trees, even if they kind of cross into the city limits and find a little canyon, they're still always in the cover of trees. So, you know, they're quite cryptic. And the, the other thing too, is that the more people are around, the more nocturnal they become. And so even though they're in trees, they're also, to the extent they move, they're also only moving at night. This is uh, Mount Lyons on the UCSC campus. Um, same story. Uh, um, you know, following the ravines, staying in the forest, um, uh, never out in the big meadows. Now, that's not to say mountain lions don't occasionally do stupid things. Um, here's a mountain lion. You know, mountain lions, uh, like all species, they need to disperse and find a home of their own when they leave their mom. And they want to get kind of the, the males particular, but even the females sometimes they want to get they want to get away from home because they don't want to end up breeding with their sister or their cousin. You know, they want to, you know, breed with an individual from a non-related family. So the best way to do that is to go far. And um, so they they disperse and they go out seeking new country and and when they do that they're moving through a landscape that they're not familiar with and so uh, sometimes they make mistakes like this animal who went um, uh, through basically the town of I think it was Los Gatos uh, to Highway 85 and when I first looked at this I thought oh that animal must be moving across a river drainage um, but actually no it's just moving through people's backyards and this animal got to the edge of Highway 85. This is a like a you know 20 foot high concrete wall. So it couldn't get couldn't go any further. And then it spent the night underneath this tree, or perhaps underneath this person's boat in their backyard. And then it came back the next evening uh, to open space, and no one ever was the wiser for it. Um, that's not always the case. A lot of the time when animals go into urban areas. Um, you know, they're spotted by people and, and there's a response. And so this was a mountain lion that uh, uh, came through a motel in downtown Santa Cruz, uh, was chased by the police into this aqueduct, um, couldn't get out. And then um, uh, this was um, right when the law changed from, you know, prior to this, uh, um, you know, the police or CDFW would come in and, and they'd usually, you know, euthanize the cat. Um, but then there was a law passed a few years ago that, you know, highly encouraged local law enforcement and CDFW to do whatever they could to non-lethally remove these animals. So this was, uh, I think, possibly the first test case. Uh, the police certainly didn't know how to catch a mountain lion and, um, uh, CDFW didn't have much expertise at the time either. So luckily this happened in Santa Cruz and we could help. Um, so we came in and under the gaze of news reporters and hundreds of people uh, uh, anesthetized the cat. And we had the sort of, you know, the best vets in town come and help us out. And we're able to sort of safely get the animal back into open space. Um, here's another instance of a sort of similar thing happening. Uh, this yellow line, this long straight yellow line is our collar coming in from Germany. And then uh, us driving out to put it on a young male um, uh, near Big Basin National uh, State Park. And you can see uh, the animal moves around like this. He's still with his mom here. And then all of a sudden he takes off and this is his dispersal track. And then he ends up over here near Mountain View, not such a good place to be. Um, basically, he wanders through sort of, you know, fairly residential area. He crosses 280. He decides it's not urban enough for him. And he ends up in 
downtown Mountain View at about five o'clock in the morning on this corner and uh, decides maybe this isn't the best place to be. So he finds a bush over here next to this house. And this is the bush that that mountain lion was hiding behind for about, uh, you know, from five in the morning till about five or six o'clock in the evening. And then, uh, and then um, he makes a dash for it. Uh, uh, the police apparently are notified. Uh, helicopters come out and start searching for it. And eventually they chase him into this covered parking garage. Um, and uh, the Mountain View police, you know, they're in Silicon Valley. And so they're quite uh, social media savvy. They immediately start tweeting about it, possible mountain lion sighting, uh, seeing with a radio collar around his neck, do not approach more info as we have it. And then um, instead of giving me a call or uh, maybe an email or a text, they start tweeting at me. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't savvy enough to recognize I was being tweeted at, but fortunately they found my number and they called us. Um, and then, um, and then they did this great thing. They created this uh, hashtag NV Puma. So they could start tweeting about it and sharing their stories with each other using this hashtag. And uh, so Julie Vasquez writes sheltered in place and we have a hashtag exciting night in the Silicon Valley. And Nancy writes uh, helicopter looking for a mountain lion in our neighborhood. Uh, hashtag MV Puma. So you got to start to get a sense for what it was like there. And then when we showed up, this was kind of the scene outside. There was this mess of reporters and people and um, and they had sort of cordoned off an area. And luckily the garage was equipped with zoo, zoo grade iron gates. Um, and Raj Matai writes on Twitter, mountain lion spotted in Mountain View. Mountain View PD with guns drawn, tranquilizers near Rangsdorf in California. Um, this guy, Trapper Dang, writes, Mountain View PD cornered MV Puna beneath a car in an apartment complex. That's my complex, and it's probably my car. And so here's the mountain lion uh, kind of cowering beneath this minivan. And uh, all of a sudden, wouldn't you know it, but the mountain lion himself pops up with his own Twitter account and starts tweeting from underneath the minivan. And he writes, this game warden guy has a weird looking gun. Why do you think I'm under the car? Um, and you guys, they've got me surrounded. So, um, you know, it was quite the, the strange way to catch a mountain lion, but, um, I ended up driving in there with the chief of police and uh, leaning across his lap with my dart rifle and anesthetizing the mountain lion underneath this minivan. And uh, we, got him, uh, we got him safely into open space. And we had like a four car siren escort bringing him back out into the mountains. And so it all actually went very well. And then here he was captured on camera a couple of days later. And once you know it, but he's back on Twitter uh, saying, glad to be back out in open spaces and soft hills. That city concrete is murder on the pause. Um, humans call me 46M, but my friends call me Rory. And then this was my favorite tweet of the day. We should use the MV Puma hashtag to organize a block party. This is the most contact I've ever had with my neighbors. Um, so, uh, that's a little bit about, you know, uh, how mountain lions move and can potentially get in trouble. And, um, you know, we want to create spaces for them where instead of ending up in, you know, downtown Mountain View, maybe they end up in, you know, an adjacent mountain range. And so to do that, we need to understand where the important corridors are for them to cross from one place to another. So, um, so, so here's how we sort of go about doing that. We, we can document a number of different behaviors of mountain lions. So 
um, and where they occur on the landscape. So for instance, here's a movement track of the animals and we can say at each one of those locations, the animal's moving. So movement is one behavior. Um, feeding is another behavior. We can find these clusters of GPS locations and we go and we hike in those, hike to those and we can find the remains of prey and we can say where they're feeding. So that's another behavior of feeding. I like to think of feeding and movement as sort of survival related behaviors. And then there's a suite of re reproductive behaviors. So um, mountain lions um, are solitary animals, but the males spend a huge amount of time sort of circulating around their home range and making these scrapes in the, um, in the ground with their back legs and they urinate in there a little bit. And uh, from the urinary proteins, they can tell who's been there by smell. And then uh, they also, there's also pheromones in the urine. They also have a gland on their cheek, which they rub on things, which also has information about reproductive status. And then the, the females will start circulating around, um, it will start circulating around to these scrape sites when they're in heat. And I'm sorry, you can't hear the, Oh, shoot. I'm sorry you can't hear the video because um, uh, once they, they get there, this, this female is screeching like wow, wow, wow. And uh, that pulls in the male and then they hook up and they spend two or three days uh, walking around together and breeding. And then three months later, uh, kittens are born. And so the female will, will sort of find a nursery site, which is basically just a a, a, a really remote place, you know, inside a thicket of, of bush or redwood burl or something like that, and keep them there six to eight weeks. And then once they're old enough, she'll start bringing them around to kill. So she'll go kill a deer, she'll bring the kittens there, then she'll go kill another deer, and then she'll bring the kittens there. And then, and then they get to the point where they're basically as big as she is. And uh, that's when she'll start circulating back around to these scrape sites and she'll uh, she'll kick the, the, the kids out of the, out of home basically, and they'll go and do their own thing. So, um, understanding where these, these scrape sites are, um, and where those nursery sites are and what kind of locations they like is really important to understanding, um, the reproductive, uh, behavior and, and requirements for this species. So, we can find these communication sites again using GPS locations or clusters of data, except for instead of looking for points that are really close in time, we look for points that are far apart in time. And that indicates that the animal's coming back to the same place repeatedly. And then we go there and we look for the sort of diagnostic scrape in the ground. And then uh, the den sites are really easy to find. This is this. Uh, mess of points in the middle is a den site. And what you can see is this sort of like star-like pattern where you have these lines radiating out. And what that is, is there's a kill, the animal goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to, to you know, um, uh, milk kittens and then, uh, or feed her kittens. And then um, we'll do that numerous times. And so this big mess of points is like a nursery site. So then, um, what we're interested in is, you know, how does the presence of um, buildings and roads on the landscape affect how likely animals are used to use different uh, habitats uh, to engage in these survival and reproductive behaviors. And so what you see here is each brown dot basically is a location of a human structure or home. Um, and we can ask, well, what's the sphere of influence of each one of those dots? Is it like 50 meters? Is it 100 meters? Is it a kilometer? And we can use statistics and our data to sort of figure out what is the sort of footprint over which these um, human attributes on the landscape affect mountain lands. And so we produce maps like this, where um, this is showing you the probability or relative probability that an animal is going to use any particular part of the landscape. And as you go down the color ramp from, you know, white to red, they're less and less likely to use those areas. So basically the way to read this is anywhere where you have this sort of white or kind of cream color, mountain lions are moving around feeding and 
not really caring at all about people or homes on the landscape. Now, when you get start moving up the color ramp, they start caring more and more, and we'll start sort of avoiding those places more and more. So these sort of purple blue areas are sort of places where you have a lot of rural development. Mountain lions will go into those areas, but they're probably not as likely as these cream colored areas. And then the red is sort of our urban areas and they're really, really opposed to going there for the most part. Um, so this is what the landscape looks like to mountain lions when they're feeding and moving. Um, but if they're denning or communicating with each other, then they have a much more restricted sort of feel of the landscape. They're much less likely to communicate or den uh, close to people's homes than they are to move and feed. And so all of a sudden these white areas, um, which represent the places where they feel totally comfortable um, communicating and denning um, are a much sort of narrower restricted part of the landscape. So we can think of these white areas as places where you know, um, there's, uh, these are sort of high quality breeding habitats. Um, and then we can think of, uh, uh, and, and just to point out this big white area here was um, uh, recently, a few years ago, acquired um, by this consortium of NGOs and, and preserved. And then we can think of these sort of purplish blue areas where mountain lions you know, they avoid, but they also will go there as places that are kind of rife for human wildlife conflict. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, particularly over people's goats. And so those are places where, you know, we can focus education efforts, we can uh, trap children in cages. <laughs> this is one of my graduate students doing a, a talk at a, at a school and she brought the cage with her to show uh, show how we catch the animals. Uh, we use cage traps in addition to dogs to um, to catch animals for collaring purposes. Um, and then uh, we can use our insights about you know where the breeding behaviors are. So that's this green stuff is where the important green uh, important breeding behaviors are. And then we can use the maps relating to movement to sort of predict how they're going to move across the landscape. And then we can use these, these insights to create connectivity maps showing where we would predict animals to, in this case, cross Highway 17, the, the major highway that bisects the Santa Cruz Mountains. And this sort of brown purplish areas where we would predict mountain lions would want to cross Highway 17. And then these dots and pluses are where animals actually did cross Highway 17. And so you can see there's a nice correspondence between models and data, and we like that. And as a result of um, this analysis, they're, they're now in the um, uh, Caltrans um, is now in the process of um, uh, building tunnels across the road to enhance wildlife movement in both these locations. Um, and you know that had a lot to do with some local land trust like the Santa Cruz County Land Trust and uh, Post and the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. Um, so I think that's all I'll say for today and open it up to questions. Um, we do have a website if you want to check us out with um, a Puma tracker that sort of shows where the animals are moving or around the landscape and um, some fun videos and blog and that kind of thing. So maybe I'll open it up to questions. Um, we could do this through the chat or um, you can turn on your microphone. Maybe let's see, there's, um, there's one question already that says, have you experimented with different types of human voice such as male versus female or adult versus child? Uh, we've done males and females and didn't see any difference. We did not do children though. Um, and then there's another one, it's another chat thing. It says, it appears that females and males have different hunting patterns. What's the difference? Uh, I think that's probably referring to the um, slide where I showed that the kill rate increases with housing density for females, but it didn't look like it did with for males. And I think the main reason for that is that males 
don't get as urban as females do, um, uh, namely because they have much larger home ranges. And so to have a really big home range in the Santa Cruz mountains, you have to encompass a lot more wild areas. Um, and so uh, they just don't uh, have home ranges over as wide a range of housing density. Um, okay, wow, this is a different way to do questions. <laughs> Um, okay, are any of the pumas in the Santa Lucia's or the preserve pollard? No, we haven't done any work outside of the Santa Cruz mountains here, around here. How, how likely is it that a female would return to a previous denning site year after year? Um, I don't think too likely there, you know, it's, it's not a den like, like with canids, like coyotes or or wolves, you know, they'll dig a big hole and they'll use the same den site or group of den sites year after year after year. Females or mountain lions, there's there's no hole. It's just, you know, <laughs> often it's just in a big mess of poison oak or something kind of nasty to get into. Um, and uh, I, I don't think they use this, or at least we haven't seen any evidence that they use the same one year after year. What is the most likely time of year when we would hear the female screaming to attract a mate? Um, you know, mountain lions can, uh, can have litters at any time of year, although we do see a kind of pulse in the spring and summer. And so, you know, as a result of that, I would say, you know, um, that uh, night that's all you know, winter, spring is probably the most likely time to hear that. Uh, any advice for if human encounters a mountain lion on foot? Um, well, you know, the, the general advice that you see on all the signs is to hold your ground, you know, wave your arms, look big and menacing. Um, that's, that's probably the best thing you can do. There was a study out of UC Davis a few years ago that looked at all the encounters with mountain lions that led to... Um, and uh, and they asked, well, what did the people do and what was the outcome? And what they found was that if you ran, you were less likely to get attacked by the mountain lion, but that if you did get attacked, you were more likely to die. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, that didn't, uh, to me, provide, you know, much help. Um, in evaluating this. Um, yeah. So I, I think I would just, you know, um, I would I would just hold my ground, look big. If I have, if I have small kids, I'd bring them in close to me. Uh, most times that you see a mountain lion, um, if you have time to think about what you're going to do, uh, chances are it's not interested in attacking you. You know, they are an ambush predator. And so if they were going to attack you, it would have probably already happened. Um, there should be interesting studies of movement of lions in and around state and national parks now as a result of no people. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, there's a lot of interest right now in trying to understand how COVID-19 is impacting wildlife populations, not just mountain lions, but you know, really uh, wildlife globally. And so, we're participating in a couple of efforts. Um, one is a sort of more global look at COVID-19 and how it's impacting wildlife. And then one is, another one is more focused on mountain lions and um, how this would affect their behavior and ecological impact. You know, at least around here, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if, if, you know, the, the impact to me seems to be that there are actually quite a few more people using open space than before, but that um, there's a lot less people on the roads. And so, um, you know, I think what I would expect is that um, there's gonna be some response by mountain lions to actually more use of, you know, state parks and that kind of thing close to town, but maybe um, less 
fear and more ability to cross roads and so less of a sort of hard barrier where you have busy roads. Um, given the fragmentation of the habitat, have there been efforts to promote breeding across different areas? So yeah, the main, the main effort there I would say is um, uh, trying to enhance connectivity between different mountain ranges. So uh, building the tunnels across Highway 17 is one of those. Um, the Coyote Valley is a valley that separates the Santa Cruz Mountains from the Hamilton Mountain Range to the east. And uh, the uh, Peninsula Open Space Trust in the city of San Jose just bought 900 acres of the valley floor for uh, something like 93 million bucks with the idea to restore habitat and improve connectivity between the two mountain ranges um, for mountain lions, but also for a number of other species. Um, there's similar kind of efforts going on now um, between the Gabilan Mountains and the Santa Cruz Mountains, at the sort of far southeast of the Santa Cruz Mountains. There's an effort in uh, the Santa Monica Mountains to build a a bridge across, I uh, can't remember if it's the 101 or the 405 or one of the big freeways there. So, so you know, the, the efforts that um, I think are really promising are these efforts to enhance connectivity. Um, I wouldn't be a big proponent of moving animals around to enhance connectivity because, um, you know, while that might have a temporary, temporarily benefit populations, it would sort of obscure the impacts of development on populations so that there would really be no ability to uh, improve connectivity in the future and prevent more, uh, more deterioration of connectivity um, uh, if you were to do that, because you would no longer have the genetic tools to be able to evaluate whether connectivity is an issue or not if you were moving animals around. Um, thank you, Chris. Birds were a small fraction of the diet in your study. Do you have turkeys in that area? We wonder whether young turkeys are part of your puma's diets. Yeah, geez, I wish they were. Um, we have more and more turkeys, you know, from my house on any given day, I can see 50 or 60 turkeys. <laughs> and uh, we have found hundreds, if not thousands of prey remains at Mount Lion Kills. And um, I don't think we've found one single turkey yet. Uh, you know, maybe one or two, but it is not a prominent part of their diet. Presumably the preserve and Ventana wilderness is highly suitable. Do you have a count? Um, so no, we haven't done any research in, um, in the San Lucia mountains. Um, there is a state led effort right now to do a count of mountain lions across the state. Um, so they're going to different areas and trying to get estimates of mountain lions in each area. Um, so at a certain point in time, um, you know, there probably will be an estimate of mountain lions in the Ventana wilderness, or at least the, the Central Coast mountains down there. Um, we do know from the genetics, though, that mountain lions in the, you know, mountains from, say, Monterey south to, um, uh, you know, Santa Barbara or, or in and around there, you know, are, 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 are doing the best of the mountain lions along the southern coast of California. Uh, I think that's just because there's, that's the largest contiguous block of habitat for them. Did you use Observational data to test your habitat suitability model? If so, were the number of observations sufficient and did it improve the accuracy of the model? Um, well, all the, I'm, I'm not exactly sure I understand the question, but the model is built on um, 
on data and um and and then you know we did various tests to look at how robust the model was uh, what did you predict you will see in the GPS data of the lion's behaviors for the time period where we are sheltering in place and limiting our human movement? Um, yeah, we, we haven't, you know, I mentioned uh, this is sort of the same as the question earlier. We've, we've um, got some ideas, like I explained before, but uh, have not put that to the test yet. Is there much data about mountain lions killing wolves? Um, so in Yellowstone, where I also do research, um, you know, you have mountain lions and wolves uh, in the same ecosystem. And, you know, by and large, mountain lions are the sort of, uh, are the loser in that situation. So, um, you know, if, if one wolf were to, fight one mountain lion in a fight. <laughs> I'd take the mountain lion every time just because mountain lion has five weapons and a wolf just has one. But uh, the reality of it is, is that when a mountain lion meets a wolf, they're not just meeting one wolf, they're meeting many wolves. And so uh, mountain lions usually end up coming out on the losing end of that encounter. Um, so there have been a number of mountain lions to have been confirmed getting killed by wolves in, in Yellowstone. And it's usually when uh, they get caught out in the open. So again, uh, if you're a mountain lion, you want to stay close to a tree at all times uh, if there's you know, wolves or dogs around. And so um, you know, I think that's, that's why um, you know, even in our area where you don't have wolves, mountain lions are, are, are still spending time, you know, they, they, they rarely if ever go out into the meadows and, you know, really all across North America, you're not gonna find a mountain lion anywhere close, anywhere where there's not escape cover really close by. Now that changes when you get to, um, to Argentina and Patagonia um, where there is no large canid that, uh, that can kill a mountain lion. And so the mountain lions there have, uh, you, you'll see them out in these open meadows hunting guanacos. But, you know, it's really a different animal than North American mountain lions. Go ask him one question. So, hi, as pumas avoid residential sites, um, did you see an increase in the number of meso predators such as coyotes? Uh, great question. Um, we've looked at that a little bit with um, with cameras, and um, yeah, basically, you know, where you have mountain lions, you tend to get fewer coyotes and more foxes, and where you don't have mountain lions, you tend to get uh, more coyotes and fewer foxes. That's one of the relationships. Um, and then there are a sort of number of sort of other relationships, but they're quite complicated because um, there's the relationship between mountain lions and housing density. There's the relationship between mountain lions and their these other meso predators. There's the relationship between the meso predators themselves and how much they like or don't like residential areas. Um, the one with coyotes and foxes, though, is the sort of clear. How large of an area does a mountain lion need for its territory? Uh, mountain lions in our area tend to have home ranges about you know, 50 to 150 square kilometers. I think bears benefit from the presence of lions by feeding on their kills. Is there a positive inverse relationship for the lions if bears are present in the same ecosystem? Yeah, great question. So bears, uh, bears will scavenge from mountain lion kills and so particularly in places with high bear densities, you know, just about every mountain lion kill will end up getting scavenged by a bear, sometimes very quickly. And so um, it kind of has the same effect on mountain lions that people do and that it sort of uh, reduces the amount of meat that a mountain lion gets from their kill. And so they have to respond by killing more. And so, um, you know, the bears are kind of making it more difficult for mountain lions. Mountain lions are making it 
nice and easy for the bears and the mountain lions have to respond by killing more deer. If you have to capture a young animal that's strayed into populated areas, how do you determine whether to relocate the animal considering presence of other colored animals in your study, et cetera? Yeah, so I think the best thing to do when you, uh, when you um, are relocating an animal from an urban area or populated area is to just put it back in the closest um, uh, um, in the closest, uh, you know, open space to where you caught it. And, and importantly, you know, where you think it came from. So if, 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 and this has happened, if you caught a mountain lion, if we caught a mountain lion in San Francisco, I would not then go and plump it in the Marin headlands, which might actually be a little bit closer than, you know, the Santa Cruz mountains. Um, but the Santa Cruz Mountains is, you know, almost surely where it came from. So I would put that animal back in sort of closest uh, accessible habitat in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I would not go and put it in Marin. Um, again, because of that genetic issue we discussed earlier. Um, and, you know, as far as, you know, uh, how that's going to be for the animal, well, um, you know, the reason the animal went into the urban area in the first place um, <clears throat> uh, is, uh, you know, this is likely because it's looking for to get away from um, uh, where it grew up and looking for new habitat. But it's, it's, it's probably not happy that it ended up in an urban area and just couldn't figure out how to get out. Or in, in some cases, they get so deep in urban areas, they can't figure out how to get out. Usually what happens though is they get into an urban area and before they have time to get out, um, you know, they're spotted and then a management response sort of uh, happens. So, you know, if there's open habitat nearby, I would usually just advocate for just, you know, leave that animal alone. You know, the next night it's going to, once night fall comes, it's usually going to, um, it's usually going to leave. We did have an interesting circumstance where, um, there was a uh, mountain lion that was caught in Burlingame, just south of San Francisco, which is a, you know, a, uh, a city basically with, you know, a house every quarter acre and, um, or half acre. And, um, and so we relocated it to um, nearby open space. I mean, not that nearby, you know, line of sight, it was probably 10 or 15 miles away. And then, uh, you know, we put a collar on it. And when that animal walked up, woke up, it beelined straight back there and ended up spending the next three months living in the town of um, Hillsboro, which is half acre zoning. And, you know, that was that animal's home range. Um, uh, kind of crazy. And uh, that animal didn't live very long. It ended up dying in mange uh, for, you know, uh, reasons that we discussed earlier. What effects did the prior drought have on mountain lions? Um, I'm not sure. We haven't uh, we haven't looked at that yet, but it's on our list of to do items. We have an 11 foot fence around our homeland, about 1.5 acres. One night we watched a large male walk across the patio outside, about 10 feet from us inside our bedroom. How tall a fence can they jump? What would be a reason he might want to come inside the fence right next to the house. Uh, good question. Um, I'm not sure you can build a tall enough fence to keep out a mountain lion because uh, you know they can climb. So uh, I, I would kind of think of a a fence. You know, trying to keep a mountain lion out is kind of like trying to keep a a human out. So. Um, but you know, maybe a human without um, an ability to cut through a fence. So you know, if 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 it's a twenty foot fence, the mountain lion could still probably climb up it. Um, why would the mountain lion want to come in? Uh, probably it saw um, something interesting on the inside. You know, maybe there was uh, uh, something it was interested in in eating. Um, 
you know, some uh, skunk or um, I don't know if you had any deer get inside your fence or goats or um, dog or something like that, possibly. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it's typical that a mountain lion is going to jump a fence um, just because um, usually there's going to be an attractant involved. It could also be depending on how the fence is situated with respect to movement routes. If it was the only way for it to get from point A to point B, it might have had to go through the fence. I'm not sure what the layout is, but those are just some thoughts. So I think I've come to the end of the questions. Um, 